Hello everyone. So before I start my discussion, I just wanted to congratulate the organizers for such beautiful performances from the students. I don't connect with schools much. So today I actually spent the entire day watching this and I'm really very happy that okay, this generation of children are doing really well because I only work with the officers and they are really boring. So <laughs> I really enjoyed this afternoon. Uh, without much ado, I will just want to bring some key words into the conversation because since morning we have been talking about patriarchy, we have been talking about um, different kind of biases, prejudices. One thing that we are also have to remember, whenever we are talking problem, we'll also have to talk solutions. So if there is a problem, is if there is a gap, there also has to be some solutions. And whenever we are talking gender mainstreaming, before I get into mainstreaming, I also want to clarify, when we are saying gender, it is not a myth that when we are saying gender, we are talking about all the categories. It's not just women. We are talking women, men, transgender, any other category. But when we look at the data of the current times, we see that the gap is skewed against the women. Globally, it's not just India. Globally, it is skewed against women. And therefore, all the interventions, all the strategies, all the uh, mainstreaming uh, tools that we are applying, are for the women because we need to pull them up to the balance, to the, to, to the equal footing. And therefore, when we say mainstreaming, we are primarily trying to say that there is a section of people who need to be brought to the mainland or main, mainstay. And therefore, when I'm talking gender here, it is generally the women. Having said that, when I say uh, some key words, Equality, equity, and justice. Is the uh, picture visible to everyone? So when we say equality, because if we look at the trajectory of women's rights movement, we have moved from different uh, conversations to the current time, which is justice-based, right-based. We have talked about equality. As the image is talking about, we are giving everyone the same stand to stand on and then uh, uh, bring, uh, bring the conversation ahead. However, we over a period we realized that okay, just giving the footing does not work. We also have to look at, there are some who need more uh, 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 provisions and therefore the stand, as you can see, changes. And that's where reservations and all the other affirmative action uh, uh, strategies that public, uh, 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 not financing, but public uh, domain brings in, comes into the conversation. And that's where women's reservation to different public resources is critical. Now, when over a period of time, because these are generational discussions that we are having, when we have had a decadal change in the trend, Say, for instance, uh, uh, since morning, we have been hearing about uh, different forms of violence, different forms of uh, patriarchal uh, biases that we live through. And uh, one of it is in uh, intimate partner violence. And when we talk about intimate partner violence, in today's time, it is not just women who are facing it. There are men also who are uh, facing uh, different forms of violence uh, among their partners, be it same sex, be it uh, heterogeneous, but there are uh, forms of violence that men also face. However, when we are working on those subjects, we are not able to take the men into the conversation because it is not reported. Because we work on a subject when it is reported. NCRB in India is the data source for understanding the uh, crime against women uh, scenario across the country. And in the N NCRB data, it is fed from the FIRs that are filed in the police stations, the respective police stations. No men, as of now, very few, goes to the police station to file an FIR about a violence that he has faced against, uh, uh, with his partner as of now. And this is where I want to bring the patriarchy discussion. Patriarchy does not just affect women. 
it also affects men when uh, we very very uh, very uh, in a running uh, language we use ladko ko nahi rona chahiye men should not cry or men uh, why is a boy child crying that actually poses a very big problem a so societal conditional problem to the child because he or she whoever is watching is also learning that okay there is a st specific behavior pattern that a uh, x uh, individual has to follow and throughout the world, the life cycle so that creates a gap and that is where when we talk about equality when we talk about balance we are saying that everyone if i want to cry i should cry very freely if my brother wants to cry if my husband wants to cry anybody wants to cry just feel free to cry there shouldn't be a subjective aspect to it or uh, showing your emotions should not be based on your gender so these things when we keep in mind as somebody who is working in the policy uh, level we have to be mindful of all these aspects and this is one imagery i i am not sure if it is very clear this is a 9 year old child who when asked by one of his uh, male members in the panchayat what does your mother do she why will she sit in a panchayat discussion he drew this that he thought about the entire day what his mother does and he drew this right from starting from cooking to cleaning to bathing the children to uh, uh, taking the fodder from uh, for for cooking fuel basically and then repairing going to the market to get the things these are the visuals that the child could remember of his mother doing throughout the day this was acclaimed so well that kerala government used it as their cover page for gender budgeting that they announced a couple of years back why do i talk about this because when we say men are not sensitive i take this example a boy child saw that his mother his grandmother the women in the, his villages were doing these things throughout the day so i thank those parents and those uh, uh, agents of socialization who actually brought that sensitivity in the child to actually observe it that way so now coming to what i generally do i generally talk to government officials state and uh, union level on understanding how a budget head should be seen through a gender lens sounds a little technical boring but i'll tell you it is very very exciting because we are looking at a individual from cradle to grave because all line departments or all departments covers the life cycle of a individual so when i am talking to uh, say for instance social welfare department i am looking at different dimensions of a women or girls or uh, boys child's life cycle when i am talking to finance department i am looking at the overall budget head but when i am talking to an uh, say for instance uh, when we say uh, infrastructure transport is one of those uh, departments where generally they say that gender neutrality is there it is it is um, like there are there are no issues about gender in a road so when we are able to have that conversation with those officers to understand how a road is also a gender issue it actually opens up their eyes to understand that okay when i'm allocating for a district road or if i'm allocating for a straight road or when i'm uh, when we have conversations with the national um, highways authorities also because they already have a program on that so when we have this conversation and we, we are able to insert that gender dimension to the conversation it actually makes gender uh, sensitive roads gender responsive roads or for that matter even electricity when when a electric department official is unaware and is struggling to look at his budget heads to understand how the hell am i going to do gender in this and i point out when we have these uh, brainstorming discussion that we point out that okay you have a head which is saying that this 
particular uh, stretch of your uh, lines will go through a, a habitation area. Wherever there is a habitation, there is movement. A person A will move from A to B and A to Z. Every, every dimension of the uh, habitation will be trudged. Women generally do not travel alone. That's a, that's a uh, pattern. I'm talking rural. So please be mindful. I'm not talking Gurgaon. Gurgaon is a city. Even in Gurgaon, there are many issues. But I'm particularly talking about rural. So in that setting, we generally do not find women traveling alone for anything until and unless it is an emergency. So when they are traveling or where they are, they are walking down a street, their safety is, at the back of their mind, their safety is a paramount issue. Because as of now, very few cases, but generally if teasing is done by the men or the boys, it is not the women doing the other way around, right? So generally when a woman or a girl is going out of her house to uh, access some service, it is very, very important to give her that sense of safety. Lighting up a road adds to that. So if electricity department is, un uh, is able to understand that, okay, uh, there is a stretch of say three kilometers, and uh, if we had a uh, provision for two, uh, two posts in a uh, lamppost in the, that stretch, and I pull it to five, there will be a little bit of uh, budget change. However, it will be safer for those uh, people living around that places. So in that sense, if that road changes, the livability of that area changes. It becomes more accessible, it becomes more safer. So in that sense, gender budgeting allows governments to use administrative and fiscal policies to promote gender equality. And also, when we start the conversation with any state, I currently, uh, like recently uh, finished uh, hand-holding one of the remote northeastern states that, was, uh, that had signed up for it for the first time. In India, it has started since 2005 but many states are now recently taking it up. So I see it as a win because um, uh, being uh, zero to one is any day better. So in that sense, there are states who are recently signing up, but they are doing exceptionally beautiful work, like a very, very uh, progressive work. So you need to have a need assessment. If a region, and, and these need assessments should be geographically located. One study that is done in Gurgaon cannot hold true for where I live, GK2 and uh, Gurgaon do not have same stories. The stories, the livelihood, the uh, li uh, living patterns will be different, right? So if I don't have a need assessment of that location, my plan will be very, very generic and it will not benefit those people living in those regions. And again, I stress, uh, we generally work with the rural settings, so it is all the more important. And it should not be post, fact, uh, post hoc analysis, as in it should not be that we have gotten into the discussion, sorry, gotten into the discussion, and then we are thinking, OK, let's do an assessment. That is very, very uh, erroneous. We should not go for that. Why practice gender budgeting, as we said? It is a positive, it has a positive correlation to the growth as uh, in the morning also one of the uh, guests has shared that if we are able to bring in more uh, women friendly policies, the, the participation of women in the workforce rising will actually add to the GDP's rise. That is a logical uh, understanding and, and it has been scientifically proven through different studies. But to do that, you have to build an enabling environment. Gender budgeting as a tool helps you build that environment. And, it, and, and, and uh, uh, the other thing is, on an average, a state uh, body or a central body has around 50 to 60 departments uh, or ministries. There are no departments or ministries that can say that it, it does not need a gender balance. We can put a gender lens in every conversation because any and every department caters to somebody. And that body is a human body, generally. If, if, if it is a different body, then obviously in that also we will look into the gender of that 
subject. Who will gender budgeting help? As we have by now understood, gender budgeting will not only help the women and the girls, it will help the overall society. And it, we also have to understand that we are actually talking about investing on human capital. It is not, uh, I, I mean, uh, it is not kind of an expenditure. It is an investment because as uh, some of the children, uh, some of the students have shared today, they are worried about the future of their uh, of, of theirs in the ecosystem that they are living now. I, when I am listening to this, I am feeling very uh, happy that there is a section of children who even have that thought process. When I am talking to my rural uh, settings. Those children don't even know these words. They don't even know these realities. So in that sense, I was very happy to see that the children here are so aware and so uh, updated on the things that need to be worked upon. So when we are saying, uh, we are talking about investment and everything, we are particularly saying that we are looking at a positive change. We are not thinking about something regressive. How do we go about gender budgeting? The Ministry of Finance is the one who actually issues this order. And in uh, India, it was announced in 2005. Since then, uh, the Depart uh, Ministry of Finance have been issuing the gender budget statement throughout this period. Many ministries have participated. Many ministries have dropped out. Many ministries have rejoined. Uh, this is a uh, uh, regular process. Because uh, as we all know, until and unless there is an act, there is no compulsion for any state or uh, central ministry to work on it. And as of now, it is on a, in a policy level, though that that's where there is a subjective aspect to it. There are two major levers. That is, one is tax measures and direct expenditures. So when we are talking to the ministries or, or the departments, we are trying to understand how this works. Say, for instance, if we look at the example of uh, 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 some time back, there was a lot of hue and cry on uh, sanitary napkins being charged higher. The, the uh, interest rate was higher on that. And that got did, uh, deducted over a period of discussion very, very immediately itself. But when we look at the overall conversation in that uh, subject, we understand that the team that was working on it was not gender aware, did not look at that requirement through a gender lens. Therefore, they had uh, put that uh, 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 tax uh, aspect to it. And when they realized that, okay, this is an error on our part, they immediately changed. So if we are saying this is an uh, aspect that can be changed, it is a dynamic subject, then we also have to give that uh, um, aspect to the officials and the other stakeholders that they can change. When we are looking, uh, sorry, the image has gone away. Okay. So when we are talking gender and when we are talking gender budgeting, we always have to keep in mind that it might sound very uh, technical, which actually it is when we sit with the departments. We actually look at the budget heads uh, major heads, uh, sub-major heads, and all these heads, and then we bifurcate and understand how it is done. But why am I talking gender budgeting here? Because you, as citizens, are also part and parcel of the conversation. Because when we look at gender budgeting, there are different stakeholders. Citizens' voice can also be part of the budgeting process. When the departments or the, uh, or the, or the ministries and put a public issue saying that this, this uh, new law or this new policy is subject to uh, your opinions, please do participate as everybody uh, goes through newspapers and we see those notifications. Yeah. So if, as a, if we want to work on this economy, we actually can participate in different roles. Your role will be to actually call out the uh, government settings on how that can be improvised. So with these words, thank you so much.